I'm Dave Stouffer. It's good to be reading from my novel that I've entitled The Reverend Mr. J.C. When Appearances Are Not Enough. The direct inspiration for this book was seeing the exact incident with a pastor asking the congregation's forgiveness for shirking his duties while kneeling on a rug. I found it so striking that I remembered it for several years while the character J.C. started to germinate in my mind. The Reverend Mr. J.C. is a story of J.C.'s personal growth when he didn't think he needed to do any more growing. It's a story of a complacent person growing into a complete person, and it's a story of an unwilling mentor, Pastor James, and James and J.C.'s surprising shared history. It's the story of a town, Prophetstown, that doesn't have much to recommend it, a broken-down economy, cold dust-covered buildings, and lots of struggling lives, but lots of good and giving hearts. Who is J.C.? The prelude ended and J.C. stepped toward the pulpit. Good morning, friends, and welcome to the house of God. His voice swelled as he added pontifically, May God himself guide and bless our worship today. And now let's join together in hymn number one, Holy, Holy, Holy. J.C. often used this hymn his favorite to start a service because it was so majestic. The Pine Grove organist played it a little faster than some did, and it really got people into the mood of being in church. After the first hymn, it was business as usual, a call to worship, an Old Testament scripture reading. There were announcements, several of which listed church activities that surprised J.C. He'd had no idea they were happening. And then it was time for the sermon. Before uttering a word, J.C., always remembering his high school and college speech and drama training, looked over the top of the pulpit and made eye contact with as many people in the congregation as were looking toward the pulpit. His eyes roamed the room with what he hoped was a genuine smile on his face. My text this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. J.C. read the entire parable, ending, and Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Friends, J.C. began. The subject of today's message is that of forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. But forgiveness can cover many other things in life. We may be Christians, but we are still humans, and we still make mistakes. J.C. was smart. He'd been to seminary. He knew enough about the Bible to find a scriptural basis for asking for forgiveness. He was pleased with how this sermon was the basis for a new beginning. So therefore, friends, thinking about how our Lord himself told his disciples to forgive 77 times, I would like to step aside from the honor and wonder of being an ordained minister to come before you as a humble supplicant. J.C. reached into the pulpit and pulled out his rug. Strangely, it gave him a feeling of comfort to handle the old rug. He laid it down beside the pulpit, and fixing his eyes firmly on the ceiling as if it opened to heaven, he knelt. Only then did he look at the congregation. Friends, I stand in need of your forgiveness this morning. I have fallen into bad habits, and I have sinned. I have sinned by not making hospital visits, by not visiting you in your homes. I have sinned by not calling on people new to our community. Now, many people might think that such sins are trivial compared to the major sins of the world. I will not name them, but just say I have not committed them. I have always been faithful to my lovely wife. I have not stolen. I have not murdered. But I have failed to give you the kind of attention that 
someone with the calling on his life that I have on mine should be giving. So this morning, I offer myself on my knees before you, asking as Jesus taught his disciples, that you forgive my sins. Knowing that if you do, when I arise from this rug and step back into my ministerial lifestyle, it will be as a repentant sinner working earnestly and sincerely to earn your trust and to fulfill the calling on my life as a minister of God. J.C. stood up. Let us pray. He gave the benediction and the organ swelled into the postlude. Instead of walking down the center aisle to take his post at the center door and shake hands, J.C. exited the platform through the door to the hall, went completely to his office, and locked the door. He was not sweating. He believed in his performance. He had converted himself. He knew that if he did this, they would forgive him. It would be Tuesday before he realized that this mountaintop experience didn't translate into anything different. He sat in his office until Jill knocked on the door. Daddy, can I come in? He let her in and she hugged him. Daddy, I don't understand what happened, but you were so wonderful. The way you talked to the people was so beautiful, it made me want to cry. No wonder everybody loves you so much. She hugged him again. Mom sent me to tell you to come on home for lunch. J.C. and Jill left the empty church together. But I don't understand, Daddy. Why did you kneel down on a rug? Honey, I didn't want to get dust on the knees of my suit. Who is James? It was 10.30 Wednesday morning when Bishop Fry rang the parsonage doorbell and James opened the door. James Edwards, a full head shorter than Bishop Fry, had the lean and stringy look of a cowboy. He had a thinning head of sandy hair that bristled out in 20 different directions and a determined jaw that seemed a trifle defiant even when he smiled. And he immediately smiled at Bishop Fry, gesturing at his casual clothing. Not very formal today, Josiah. You must think you're slumming. Bishop Fry chuckled. Not sure but what I wouldn't want to get involved in some goat milking, so I thought I'd better dress for it, just in case. It was obvious that the two men were easy with each other. When they were comfortable in the former dining room, and each had a cup of coffee beside him, James said, There's nobody with you, so I assume I'm not being stood up in front of a firing squad. They both chuckled. What's on your mind, Josiah? We have a pastor, the bishop began, in one of the churches in Frank Lewis's district who's, who's having some difficulty. Let me ask you first if you've ever heard the name J.C., John Charles Wesley. There was silence for several seconds, and then James said, Yes, I have. Nice-looking fellow, seems to play a lot of golf, doesn't really do anything but look good, that's what I've heard from talking to some of the other ministers around the conference. I think I'd have to agree, James. While J.C. looks like one and talks like one, sometimes behaves like one, he doesn't have the worth work ethic, he doesn't have the passion, he doesn't have the pastor's heart. He isn't a servant, he isn't a shepherd. It's not that he's ever done anything wrong, he's just never done a whole lot right. Bishop Fry proceeded to tell James how J.C. had left one church after another, using the rug in his sermon on forgiveness. And at the end of his narrative, he said, And James, we'd like to send him to your church as your associate. How does that strike you? James stood up, started pacing. He finally stopped in front of the bishop's chair. It doesn't strike me well at all, Bishop. Why not? Well, you do know that I knew J.C.'s father. No, I didn't, said Bishop Fry. How did you know his father? James gave a short account of his service in the army with John Sr. I'm not surprised that J.C. made it into the ministry, he said. 
His mother told everybody from the time he was in diapers that he was going to be a minister. I'd imagine her call on his life for the ministry was stronger than anything God ever put there. You don't know what you're asking, Josiah. I have things to do. I have people to look after. I've got some things going on with my body that I'm not sure what they are. I'm not looking for the easy way out here, Bishop. But let me see if I've got this straight. You want me to take this loser type into my church in Prophetstown. What do you want me to do with him? The bishop responded, James, you have, uh, you are what this man could be. And I am concerned about your recent health issues. James directed his jaw at the bishop, then looked down again, but didn't speak. Bishop Fry continued, and you ask what I want you to do? Well, that's the tricky part, James. We think what's going on with JC is not just skin deep, but soul deep. Something deep within him that needs care that we can't give. I suppose we could send him to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, but that seems rather drastic, rather clinical. What we think he needs is a good example and some tough love. And you can do both. What do you say, James? Can you do it? Bishop Fry watched as James paced the floor, visibly arguing with himself. Finally, James stopped again in front of the bishop and said, Yeah, I can do it. I don't want to do it. I'll do it for his dad, but I won't do it for him. He paused, then... I think it's a waste of time, but if you want me to do it, Bishop, I'll do it. You get him over here. The Lord himself knows that he ain't going to like this place, and I am not really convinced that the place is going to like him, but we'll give it a go for God. James leaned toward the Bishop and his brow wrinkled. Josiah, one more thing. Nobody ever went to boot camp with a wife and a kid tagging along. Where and what is Prophetstown? When J.C. left Pine Grove, the skies were partly cloudy. As he got closer and closer to Prophetstown, the skies turned cloudier. The further he drove, the darker the clouds, the darker his mood. What would this be like, working as an associate for another pastor? What would it be like without his girls, Ruth and Jill, what would the people be like? What would the church look like? The first thing he saw was a large billboard that said, Welcome to Prophetstown. He noticed the board hadn't been painted or repaired for a long time. The circular emblems for the service clubs that met in Prophetstown were all faded. And where it said in small letters at the bottom of the sign, Population 10,500 souls, someone had painted a line through the number and lettered in somewhat skillfully, 8,900. The freshest paint on the sign was a line through 8,900, and the new number, not quite so skillfully painted, 7,700. Well, that'll pop your balloon. He was coming into a town that, instead of growing and prospering, was fading away. There was a small strip mall that contained a lumber yard, one of the lesser chain variety stores, a pizza delivery place, and a hair salon. That stood across the street from a small shopping center that had plywood for windows and heavy chains securing the doors. A large faded sign announced the building's availability. He passed something he never saw in Pine Grove. A man standing on the corner holding a cardboard sign. Need food. Please help. As J.C. inched along in the traffic, he saw cars stop, a window rolled down, something extended to the man, money, he supposed. J.C. avoided eye contact as he drove past. J.C. had done some research on Prophetstown. He knew that it had been a large producer of medium-quality coal for many years and had enjoyed a time of prosperity, but federal regulations had changed and lower quality coal had be become frowned upon because of what it put into the air. The mining industry in Prophetstown had taken a major hit. 
there was still one open mine with people working there. Why was everything so dirty? When all that coal had been taken from the ground, a lot of coal dust that would have to settle someplace, he supposed that after so long a time, people got tired of spending money on paint. It didn't occur to him that perhaps they didn't have money to spend. The clouds were getting darker. He circled around some more streets, saw more of the same, and finally he pulled to the curb. I should just turn around, go to the bishop's office and say, uh, Bishop Fry, I just can't do it. They don't look like me. They don't dress like me. I can't imagine fitting in. Surely there must be some place I can do some good that's uh, cleaner. J.C. felt so alone, so out of his depth. He literally did not know what to do. J.C.'s thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the car door window. A woman stood outside of it. An older, large, black woman dressed neatly. A picture of an old-fashioned mother. A basket over her arm. Are you okay, mister? J.C. heard most of her words, and despite having little experience with black people, decided to trust her. He rolled down the window. Excuse me, ma'am? I asked, are you okay, mister? You've been sitting here quite a while looking perturbed. To be honest, ma'am, I'm... I... J.C. cast about for a plausible reason to be sitting by the side of the road and came up with a weak... I'm looking for Trinity Church. Oh, that belongs to Pastor James. What a sweet soul. Why, just the other day, J.C. interrupted. Yes, that's the one. Can you tell me how to get there? The woman, a little ruffled for the interruption, said, Yes, you go to the next corner, turn right, go down, oh, four, no, five or six blocks, then you'll be turning to your left. Well, which is it? Five blocks or six? Well, it don't matter, mister. You're going to see a sign that'll point to it. If it's five blocks, you'll see the sign. And if it's six, then there's the sign. And you turn, and it's in the middle of the block. You'll know because you'll see the steeple. So you could just drive until you see the steeple. The laughter seemed to just roll out of her body. J.C. did not see the humor. She was making fun of him. He said, thank you, ma'am, and started to roll up the window. Well, young man, you tell Pastor James that Maud Patch says hi, and I'll be by one of these days with some preserves for him. Thank you, Mrs. Patch. Mrs. Patch stepped back from the car, and J.C. reluctantly started down the street. She watched until he made a right turn at the corner, then adjusted the basket on her arm, chuckling. Big city boy, she said. Clean car, fancy clothes, uppity attitude. Pastor James will eat that boy for lunch and spit him out. What does J.C.'s transformation look like? J.C. and James together doesn't begin easily. And James has just told J.C. that J.C. won't get any time in the pulpit for a while, and that's the only part of ministering that J.C. wants to do. J.C. was angry, the kind of anger that could only be handled by action. He clattered down the steps and slammed the front door as he left the parsonage. That'll let him know I'm not happy. He began to walk. As he walked, he thought. As he thought, he got madder. As he got madder, he walked faster. I don't need to take this. I'm an educated man. I have abilities. I have talents. I'm not going to let some little rum, dumb, run down, small town preacher push me around. I can get a job. Tommy, my golfing pal, always told me he'd give me a job selling cars if I wanted. I like cars. You get to dress nice, talk to people all day, ride around, play golf on Wednesdays. Sunday mornings you could sleep in. I guess I could go back to the shoe business. They'd be happy to see me there. With my background, I could get into management. I could be managing my own store in six months. Then show him. I don't need to stay here. Just pack up and leave. All of this thinking and walking had brought J.C. to a park. It wasn't a big city park. It was a smaller area set aside by the gift of a lot where a house had stood. 
The owner had given it to the city in exchange for a promise to put some swings, a teeter-totter, and a merry-go-round for the kids to play. J.C. was getting tired from his hard and fast walk. Seeing the swings, he sat down in one. One couldn't just sit in a swing. Almost by itself, the swing started to move with J.C.'s body, and almost without knowing it, he was swinging. Since J.C. was still filled with the anger of righteousness and the hopelessness of despair, he had energy to burn. So he swung, pumping his arms and swinging his feet until he went so high that he had to check himself before he swung completely over the top. Gradually, the swing's arc decreased. He looked round the park and saw that in one corner was a little arbor with trees and shrubs offering privacy from the passerby. He made his way to the arbor and found a little bench there. Several years later, he brought Ruth to that bench and told her the story. But today he had to live it. As he sat down on the bench, the words came out. God, what are you doing? Why do I have to be so different? Then he realized that he had addressed God out loud with real words, and some of them not so nice. That couldn't have been prayer. There are words associated with prayer, for ministers, that is. God, I just don't understand it. There he was doing it again. He was talking to something or someone he couldn't see, talking like God was sitting on the other end of the bench. We've, I've always been okay. There was the business of the rug and, and the forgiveness, just because I wasn't living up to somebody's unreal expectations. But God, I always looked good for you. I was clean, shiny shoes like Dad taught. I didn't hurt anybody. God, I, I know that I probably didn't always do what everybody thought they wanted me to do, what they said you wanted me to do. And I think I could change some, God. And then basically J.C. gave God the same rationalizing explanation that he had given the congregation in Pine Grove and the three churchmen and his wife in the bishop's office. So you see, God, I can change and do those things differently, but not here, not here. Just find me another place. Show me a place to go and I will show you a new man. J.C. became quiet. And the birds sang, and the leaves and branches of the trees moved to the little breeze. And on the other side of the park, occasional traffic moved by. And he listened. He really made an effort to turn his mind off, and he listened. And there was silence, and he heard the leaves brush against each other, and he heard the birds, and far off he heard the sounds of children playing. And it felt peaceful, like on the porch at the parsonage. Then he thought that peacefulness was the boring, monotonous sound of a small town. Of course, it's quiet. Nothing's happening here. But now he had a feeling that some of that peacefulness was part of himself, responding to something. As he sat there, the tension seemed to drain away. He didn't ever hear a voice, but later he was to tell Ruth and others that God spoke to him and told him to hang around and do it James' way and give it a chance. Like real life, J.C.'s change is up and down, back and forth, and he finds himself either very uncomfortable or looking ridiculous more than once. Yes, the book has a happy ending. It's the getting there that I hope readers will enjoy, and there are moments of reflection on what being a Christian, a follower of Jesus' teachings, means. It's a book with a gentle pace, full of little pictures of small-town life, and people I hope you will like as much as I do. I'm Dave Stouffer, and thanks for visiting J.C.'s World with me.